So I'll open, the, I'll open the floor to questions, but I wanted to uh, ask our, our speakers um, after we entertain any questions you have to uh, speak on two things. One is, um, given that a lot of the people in this room are in a position to be pioneers and leaders into making these methods more widely productive, and, and the report is just kind of a vague vision of what some of the possibility is. I mean, it's, you know, it's obviously very ambiguous right now, but there is a deep feeling by th these people uh, and myself that there's something big going on here. And the second th thing uh, I'd, I'd like, um, so I'd like you to comment on how you s kind of maybe comment on all the talks we've heard today and how you see them kind of fitting together and being different components of this vision, just kind of a summary of gluing some of this together. And then the second thing I would invite you to do is to uh, give any kind of advice or wisdom uh, based on your work in these areas to people that aspire to uh, adopt and promote uh, to really become these uh, pie-shaped people uh, and help advance uh, and not only application in their field, but the, the policy and, and infrastructure and uh, sustainability and all the other challenges to make, to make this very productive. But before we get to that, do you have any other questions or reactions that you'd like to bring up to any or all of the panelists? And feel free to ask a question of all of them if you so choose. Uh, we have a mi mic here, please. Okay. <coughs> Dr. Cernak, uh, you, you mentioned a phrase in your talk that really caught my ear in the current AI environment, which is, it's more of an art than a science. We now live in an age where AI is starting to take its first steps into sort of artistic practices w in image generation, in text generation. And I'm wondering if you can describe briefly sort of how the art of constructing molecules is similar to traditional art forms and, and in the way that AI can navigate through them in, yeah, thank with you. modern techniques. Um, thank you so much for the question. Um, the, I mean, I think that the, <clears throat> on the one hand, there's, there's, there's a idolization of classics or that, you know, like the, the, the textbook that you're first given when you study this field is classics in total synthesis. And, the, and so I think that there's kind of this notion of like classical syntheses and we're all taught this like the first synthesis happened in the 1880s and then there's kind of been this like every decade there's been like a, a new landmark and so there's been excitement around that. I think that uh, in, in, in large parts, you know, I, I don't know very much about math but I understand that, you know, the, like the, a lot of mathematicians might get really excited about a mathematical proof that's just done elegantly and, and you know, that or, or in code, you know, that you you find, you know, you've got like, you adopt 15,000 lines of code and somehow you find a way to truncate it down to, you know, a thousand through some, through some shortcutting, you know, th through some, some elegant aspect to it. So I think that, you know, probably that's the, that's where the terms come from that, you know, you don't have to dig too far in the field of synthesis to find art and elegance in the field of, of total synthesis. Um, it, I mean, I haven't had a lot of time to think about the latter part that you brought up. There's been a lot of discussion around the automation of reaction development and, and drug discovery and, you know, like what will we do if, if robots can make lots of drugs and we have this, you know, a lot of jobs that, are, that, that rest on, on people making molecules and so if robots do that soon, what does that mean? Um, I've thought more about that aspect and, and it's maybe a little spooky right now, the year 2023, I think is where, you know, there's a lot of predictions that the industry will kind of, there's been a lot of proof of concept work over the past 10 years. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of in the pharmaceutical industry being pointed towards maybe enterprise scaling of some of the automation that's happening right now, which could, you know, in the not too distant future lead to new types of work. Um, and yeah, so I don't know if that, you know, fully, um, or, may, I'm, I'm going to be thinking about your question for a long time, I think, because, I mean, the, the yeah, so I think that the, the art aspect of it is something that is, is really important to, to maintain, and, um, yeah. 
Let, let me ask a follow-up question to that. So you see pictures of time of people in VR rooms, 3D, you know, looking at molecular structures and so forth. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that just uh, decoration or could you, I mean, we had the famous benzenes in the ring, mm -hmm. in the fire. Uh, it, it, can you get any intuition from interacting with the things like that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, th those are the, the actual VR, from my perspective, they're incredible uh, educational tools. We, okay. we have them. They're not hugely, um, we, haven't, we haven't had any major breakthroughs in doing that. We actually have another project where we, have, we turn molecules into music. And because I showed that they're strings and you can kind of train in a bunch of strings and then we can generate music and we can like play. Our, our dream is that, you know, you can design all your molecules on DJ equipment and in the same way that, you know, I can make 30,000 people dance by twiddling knobs, but I cure cancer <laughs> with a two button mouse. Um, and so, we're, so we're, we're playing in that space. It's kind of, you know, that's why the, your question on artist, artistry in this space is kind of a fun one for us to think of. Okay. Other questions or comments? Here we go, over here. Uh, so this question, um, I think it was, when I first thought of it, it was for uh, like a reaction to Professor Schneider's talk, but I feel free for everyone to give the, your own interesting perspectives on it. But um, in a case where, such as what Professor Schneider um, presented on we can't use really conventional uh, supervised machine learning techniques. We don't have labeled data. Um, we want to try to formulate as inverse problems, but it's really hard due to lack of observability to validate also using conventional techniques. How can we establish trust in our modeling when that sort of validation is, is so difficult? Yeah, it's an important question. Um, so for most physical aspects that I talked about, we can, I mean, let's take the clouds again, my biggest source of uncertainties. We can do simulations of clouds in different climates pretty easily in these high resolution simulations. We can resolve everything but the microphysics. So the microphysics remains uncertain, but the rest we can resolve. So what we did to convince ourselves that what we do has, has merit is, say, use training data only for the present climate and then simulate warmer and colder climates and make sure that the models we trained generalize well to the warmer and colder climates, and they do. So that at least, for me, builds trust in the approach. Now where you don't, it gets challenging where you don't have the ability to generate data computationally at will, right? Um, the cloud microphysics, we use computational approaches as well. You can do particle simulations we use, but it's not as reliable as the fluid dynamics. So there, you know, we build trust in the model to the degree that we trust these Lagrangian particle models, but that trust certainly isn't absolute. Um, I think in the end, so this is how we build trust for ourselves, that we try to do the best job we can, coming up as far as models, non-dimensionalizing things, feeling we understand it. But now, how does someone else trust us, right? I think that's yet another problem. We tell the story, this is what we did, and that sounds pretty good, but you know, there's someone else with a climate model also putting some data out, and, and how do you know, how do you know this is better or worse? Um, simulating the present climate well, I think is a necessary first condition, and that's a pretty high bar if you look at current climate models. But suppose now there is someone literally fitting a billion parameters and you can fit everything in the present climate well. You probably wouldn't trust that model, but how do you make the case to a customer, say, if you want to sell it in the end? I think it's gonna be challenging and I, I don't have all the answers yet. I mean, over time you build trust by predicting things and doing it right, right? But it takes time and potentially years. Anyone else wanna comment on that? You have I trust have issues, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have trust issues. <laughs> um, so actually, when you think of the end user of the model and you say customers, they are also in an environment in that situation of being able to, having to use things they are not able to evaluate. So it becomes really just trust building. And that's, I think, the 
not so easy part of it because it becomes a turf discussion rather than, you know, really scientific discussion. So um, I think making things explainable and interpretable by end users is a huge part of the work that I think no one right now has a big handle on. And that is how do we communicate scientific information in a way that the end user can actually, whoever that is, it could be public, it could be, uh, in our case, fire chiefs or burn buses, or it could be a policy maker. You know, these are different audiences. And it, there's been situations that someone will trust somebody and they say, oh, that's not accurate. And then another person is, no, we want to use that. We used it and it's accurate. And there is no scientificness in that discussion. And that is more often than not how science is being used in the societal and policy context. And if there's anything we can do to discuss that further, I think as a community, it would help a lot in the long term. So have you had a tipping point where the people who actually fight fires uh, are seeing that this is good stuff? Yes, so <coughs> we definitely have stories and case studies captured that this worked and if this wasn't there, we would make a decision to evacuate 10,000 people. And you know, but these are coming with uncertainty, right? It's mm -hmm. especially three hours into a fire versus 10 hours into a fire. Yeah. You know, we know our models are relatively well behaved if you know the environmental characteristics of the fire environment uh, well based on real time information. Mm -hmm. But then 10 hours into it, you know, especially there was one situation that they were gonna literally uh, evacuate the whole Topanga Canyon and we said no need, but it was keeping you up at night type of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's a big responsibility. So <laughs> even if we are a bit uncertain about it, how yeah. do you give that to a decision? Uh, I think decision support is an area, right? and I don't think there's huge frameworks in this area yet that yeah. develop that carries scientific information and combines it with decision support. Yeah, this definitely falls in the high risk, high gain category. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, do you want to add anything to? Well, I actually had a question for um, Ilke on, on your work. I mean, the, the fire work aside, which is so inspiring, the um, kind of the, the balance between like scalable data availability and data curation and storage versus the UI UX mm -hmm. investment. And I'm asking really very selfishly as we're about to launch a bunch of data and trying to imagine how much we should invest in the UI UX. Does that like, you know, if you, if you put the data there and it's curated and harmonized and mm -hmm. fair and open, do, do people come to it, especially if it's a popular, popular data source, or, or do you really need to invest a lot in, in the way that people are going to interact with that data? There needs to be investment on how people use it. Yeah. You know, there's a, especially, the more specialized the resources get, the more important who is using the data for what purpose. And I think the UI UX discussion for a data resource is different than end user product. And like data management community hasn't done a lot of UI UX <laughs> actually. We have catalogs, we have c concepts related to those catalogs, um, but the usability of those are still fairly low compared to uh, ap applications mm. or ap you know systems that are for a particular purpose that you could pinpoint. Um, I think, you know, things like shopping carts, for instance, were in the early 2000s that are applied. You know, you query your data, put it in a shopping cart and apply a bunch of things to it. Those were actually, in my opinion, the biggest UI UX break, <laughs> like groundbreaking work in mm. that because nobody thought of it before that way. I think in this new commons discussions, we need a similar uh, concept to be developed. How do people use it, the systems and data and models? Yeah. 
I think you know, what Alex was saying, I mean, in some ways your interface needs to be good enough, but not, you, you don't need an Apple quality interface, obviously. Mm -hmm. and right. It's maybe useful to look at the Sloan Sky Survey interfaces, Absolutely. right? And the point is that the data are, well, the, the keyword is always Arco analysis ready, cloud optimized, right? But analysis ready means that it's reasonably, it's straightforward to access the data, it's straightforward to traverse the data in machine learning workflows that people run usually in notebooks or something, right? So probably less important to have a fancy graphical user right. interface, but it is important to be able to reverse data easily, manipulate data easily. That UX, right? That's yeah. the experience of the user. <coughs> and even the iTunes, yeah. you know, Apple interface isn't that great because then you put photos in iPhoto, do you know how it's organized? And you know, it's very confusing actually. It's very hard to do. Uh, the more you work on, you know, community and acquiring data, I think that's yeah. super challenging. And Although I, it was eye-opening to me when my then two-year-old child could use iPhotos. I mean, that's a pretty good That's true. <laughs> <laughs> then if you really wanna follow where your photos are going yeah, and different know. versions of it, yeah. there's like, I tried to dig into it yeah. one time. I'm like, there's five versions of these photos. I can never get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what I'd suggest. Let, let me ask, I will go down the row here, and if each person could just give a little bit of synthesis uh, uh, and try to fit together what we've heard today uh, briefly, and then maybe if offer any kind of advice or wisdom, and we'll just go down the row and do that, and then we'll break up and if you have other questions or you want to come up and talk to the speakers, we'll, we'll do that, okay? Tapio, you want to start? Um, <coughs> so you want us to focus on broader recommendations? On no, I wanted you to just help create, maybe try to tie together aspects of what we've yeah. heard today, you know, in the context of the, of the vision that the report outlined. Yeah. And then anything else you want to say in terms yeah. of advice or recommend? Yeah, you could call them recommendations to the yeah. people I mean, I think who aspire to work in this area or with this. The, the potential for AI in the sciences is huge. I think Alex had it right. It's, it's potentially revolutionary in, in much the same way that Bacon's science 400 years revolution was revolutionary and in, in starting science to be experimental. And yet, the revolution won't happen by itself. And it's, I don't think it will be consisting of blind application of what we currently have. I mean, let, think a bit about the history of, the sci of science is perhaps useful. Um, astronomy is old. We had, we had uh, Tycho Brahe collecting big data at the time with the bare eye on planetary motion. And those data were used to fit the deep learning model of the time, which was Ptolemy's epicycles, mm -hmm. um, trying to wrong. model planets as circular motion. You could fit anything that way. It has a universal approximation theorem, much like you know, networks have. Um, so with sufficient complexity, you can fit any function that way. That's great. But circles are the wrong basis function for describing planetary motion. The right basis function is an ellipse. So Kepler came around and say, use an ellipse and you get a better fit with fewer parameters. And then Newton came around and said, you can reduce it to one parameter law. And I think we'll have to go through that same evolution to a degree, right? And right now we are working with basis functions, like values and the like, that are, you can approximate anything with it. It's great to have a universal approximation theorem, but it's not necessarily what's the sparsest, most explainable, most interpretable basis function for scientific fields. So I think what we need is to go through that evolution up to some Newton type point where the data become synthesized into what in the end hopefully will be simple models. And so we need to foster the way to get there. I think in principle, the potential of AI and computing combined is, is enormous here in that it can accelerate how, you know, what Tim was talking about. Can you can accelerate the science you can do, potential orders of magnitude. Um, in some ways, it can democratize science, right? I mean, it's, if things are automated, data are widely available, grad students can do things that you had to be a PI for not too long ago, and it can really broaden the reach of who can do science and how effectively you can do science. And to nurture the process to get to 
and more efficient and better science in the end. I think we need the things that we, we discussed, right? The, I hadn't heard the pie shape part before, but that was a good one. So you, you, I think the way I tend to say it, you know, computing in some ways is a new calculus. We, we accept that every scientist has to learn some calculus. Um, now every scientist has to learn AI computing tools just as much as you have to learn calculus and, and statistics, perhaps. Um, I think the, bro the broadening education and deepening educational base is critical. Um, it would be good to achieve that quickly. And again, I think Alex said that well, training the trainers to get exponential growth there would be nice. I find it quite revealing how the uptake of AI is driven by the availability of software right now. Uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and the like, they really drive what people do. So people do what can be done with these software packages, but that's not necessarily what is the best approach in a lot of scientific disciplines. So I think a corollary to me should be, we need to develop software that's fit for purpose in science and engineering, and that needs to be just as good software as PyTorch and TensorFlow are, easy to use, professionally maintained, and it's revealing where it comes from, right? TensorFlow came out of Google, PyTorch came out of Meta, Facebook, and came out of big professional software shops. We need structures that incentivize software development for science and engineering that will be just as good as those packages are, or built on top of them, or whatever it is, but software that becomes easy to use because in the end, people use the tools that you can just download somewhere. Um, and then I think, Il well, maybe, maybe I'll let Ilke talk more about it, but this whole incentivizing team science, I think is really important. I, I have a harder time saying how to do it. I mean, software tools, you can say funders should just put money into every proposal to develop high quality software for anything that you do that's broader purpose. It should be made public and the like, and there should just be funding to do it. You need to fund research software engineers that have stable positions at universities and the like. Um, the, the team science part and sort of the human infrastructure that I think Dan also talked about, I think is critical. You need stable, stable positions for people like research software engineers, but more, more than that, you need people in the scientific engineering enterprise who, there are a lot of them who like doing what they do, but don't necessarily want to become a professor and write the you know, N plus first publication to add onto the CV. And right now we don't have the incentive structures, the financial structures for stable positions like that. And so I think in some ways we need to get back to having stable research scientist positions and the like that, that are viable career paths, not precarious positions that you can barely live off or you don't know if you'll be laid off the next year. And I think that would help incentivizing a type of team science. Anyway. That's a great point. And I think today we heard four cases of what was mentioned also in the report. And you know we heard commonalities in them from open science to you know how they use AI and still call it science to need for new tools. So then incentivizing. And I think those are different areas, but when you look at it, the patterns are the same. And you know the type of persona science this persona who embraces those patterns are also quite different than you know one person doing everything like very collaborative very industry related very you know societal context comes in there so i don't have a lot of wisdom but i have my own experiences you know and you said wisdom and and that is i almost quit academia and this is for the <laughs> young audience because um you know, at some point, I was happy doing my computer science work and developing tools and things like that. But the things I was interested in was more about these, you know, big teams doing grand challenge science and how do you put them together. And you know, at that point, this is like 15, 20, like 15 to 10 years ago. It didn't look like a science career. <laughs> In academia, there wasn't a structure because there wasn't Midas. <laughs> there wasn't a data science institute that's a department that's completely cross-disciplinary. And now it's, I think, becoming a subculture of academia. And now I think we are seeing things like Schmidt AI postdocs that are 
built on the promise of multidisciplinary. You know, you have two advisors, two disciplines at the minimum, a methods and a disciplinary advisor at the minimum to do those. I think we'll see more incentive structures and I guess if anything discourages you, <laughs> don't. I think the, and I think being able to work with multiple disciplines also requires um, being curious and a different type of mindset and respect that, uh, and being okay with sometimes not understanding, right? <laughs> because we get frustrated with ourselves when we don't understand part of it. So it takes a lot of trust, but that trust I think needs to come with structures to ensure that trust is measurable and accountability is built into our integrated systems as well. So it's not like blind trust, like let's make sure that we can communicate each other expectations and create the technical tools needed for that communication to be translated into the system level. So. Um, well, uh, on the topics I raised, but I'd also like you to make some comments about the impact of, your, of the environment you've built, the, the automation and the methods and so forth on education, even undergraduate teaching. always, you know, I got asked the question for 15 years, I've been working in automated chemistry, and, and in the beginning there was, you know, there was a lot of, uh, of anger when I would present my work, that, you know, oh, this is a, you know, it's, you know, people will lose work, and, and until very recently, my answer has always been, you know, with, with combinatorial explosion, with the number of problems we have to solve, especially in the medicinal chemistry space, no one's at risk. I think you're not on, yeah. Is it not working? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I think that there's, you know, there. I find myself thinking a lot about, you know, like what if, what, what if, what if we kind of achieve the goal of being able to predict everything, and, and then what, right? Uh, so, I, the gentleman's question about art, I think, is an important one, and 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 a, a large part of my move from industry to to here was we haven't achieved, well, we've achieved a lot, but are not ready to talk about anything that we're doing in in the space of naturalism and or you know environmental issues were something that are really important to me um, and yet working in the pharmaceutical industry I was really good at tackling human health issues there's like species going extinct all around us right so it's like so I think that I think that AI and and a lot of what you know what we see or what, what we're all building towards is probably inherently driven towards commercial human interests or it's it's very natural to latch on to that and and you know, build a system that would be really good for saving humans and making money. And I think that that's great, but I do think that you know, trying to find ways that we can, we can use these tools to I know, conserve or you know, conservation efforts both in nature and in art. I mean, you know, what does it mean now that you know, the AI is the best artist in the world in that art competition of last year, right? So <laughs> you know, what does that mean? Um, and yeah, the uh, on on the education topic, I think that you know it's it. I always love 
any time I have the opportunity to come to this floor, uh, every time I'm just like, I, I could follow all the talks completely, but on topics I never get to think about. And so it's, it's always, I mean, Midas, I think, really helps to, to bring that you know, connectivity together. And data science is really, I mean, data science is a common language that we can all speak, right? So the, the kind of pie-shaped scientist who, who can speak data science in their own discipline uh, I think the data, you know, one leg of that pie is like, yes, you need to train in the data science aspect, and everyone here has done that, but I think that it's not that difficult, right? That, I mean, there's like very, very standard tools to do that, and, and we're, you know, we're definitely teaching in that space. Um, one of the best people on my team right now is 14 years old, and that's like a really fun thing to, to be involved in, and, um, and, you know, through, yeah, we do a lot of work teaching to, to young young kids, but I think like in, in the kindergartens around um, Ann Arbor, um, I think that the you know data science will be ingrained in in people of the future. Um, I've mentioned multiple times I was really excited about the classics and I studied very classic chemistry. I knew nothing about computers. I couldn't turn on my computer. I was the guy you know who had to like call IT to unplug it for me and stuff. And um, we were always running out of our starting materials as in, in the pharmaceutical company I worked for, so we started to miniaturize and miniaturize and miniaturize just out of necessity. We couldn't get enough material, and then suddenly we were, you know, that by necessity, we only wanted to miniaturize one reaction, but it turned out the way to do that was on a plate that has 1,500 wells in it. It was like, well, now we've got all this data. Um, and we went to IT at Merck and said, can you help us handle this data? And they said, well, you know, we don't have the resources for that, so only make as much data as you can handle. And then I had to learn Python. Um, and so the, <clears throat> I mean, I think that, the, you know, you, the point is that, you know, you, it's, it's pretty easy to jump into a new field. And I think that, uh, that you're always going to be warmly welcomed, I think, that people who, you know, there's like, you don't have any of the, you know, burnt bridges or anything in this new field. Everyone's going to be your friend, right? So, so I think that just jumping to new fields, um, particularly for younger people, I think will be, will be something to always, you know, engage in and, and kind of coming full circle to the likelihood that the most impact you're going to have in your career could be for an industry that doesn't yet exist. That's a good closing statement. Let's give a hand to our three speakers. <laughs> okay, so I declare the meeting closed. Uh, I think they can stay a few minutes if you want to chat with them.